Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. This is really fun. I have not met. Is it doctor, mister, what do I call you? You can just call me no, Ted. You have to use the you microphone. Can just call me Ted. I can just call you Ted. Yeah, All right, okay. okay. Who's the executive editor at um, Encyclopedia Britannica, which is now headquartered in Chicago? It is. Hilariously, it was started in Edinburgh 250 years ago. So my first question is, how did it migrate from Chicago, I mean, from Edinburgh to Chicago? It seems an unlikely journey. <laughs> To some extent, it is. Uh, we've been an American company since 1901. Okay. We're headquarters in Chicago since the 1930s. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But a lot of folks are, are, are surprised that we've been an American company for so long. But we actually have been since, since the turn of the 20th century. So when I was a kid, Encyclopedia Britannica was still the go-to reference source. The world's really changed, hasn't it? Now we have Wikipedia. Yeah. Yeah. It has, but uh, and it's something we'll talk about tonight. Britannica has done an amazing job of adapting to the digital age. Has it? It has. In fact, we, did, we were the very first encyclopedia on the internet all the way back in 1994, eight years before Wikipedia. And we continue you know, to be online today. If you haven't looked at yourself in, in recent years at Britannica, Britannica.com, we've had some very exciting partnerships with major companies around the world. And again, the, our value proposition mm -hmm. as a fact check verified reliable, credible uh, database yeah. is only growing in importance in the age of fake news and rampant misinformation on the internet. Well, I think, I think one thing, you know, Wikipedia is kind of a, like a voluntary thing and they're forever asking, you know, to verify um, entries in the whole nine yards. So I had, we've had this conversation, I hadn't really thought about the fact that one is really better off to look at Encyclopedia Britannica rather than Wikipedia, um, <laughs> if you want accurate information, so we should spread that word. Absolutely. In fact, uh, one partnership we just formed was with YouTube. YouTube, like many social media sites like Facebook, has had uh, a, a credibility of credibility of content problem in the age of misinformation and fake news. So they wanted to partner with us late last year to help surface credible and verifiable information. So we were happy to do so. So now, if you look on YouTube and you do a search on a topic around which a great deal of conspiracy theories have swirled, like the moon landing or the Kennedy assassination, yeah. you will now see the Encyclopedia Britannica article at the very top of the YouTube page. It's a wonderful, fact-checked, verified, well-written, well-edited primer introduc introduction to the topic. And YouTube and Britannica think we are doing our service to help surface credible information, then from there, you're, you're free to watch the hundreds of uploaded community <laughs> videos of unknown quality. You can make right. what you want of those. But we've done what we can to do to surface credible information. That's very really good. So when my husband is trying to figure out how the best way to put um, a comforter inside a duvet cover, they have an actual, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, a YouTube video to help you figure it out. This is really good to know. Now, I can say from back in the years um, when I was in law that one of the most challenging things always was to update, um, what is it, West, Case Law West or whatever. Anyway, there's a whole, um, um, for lawyers to go back and look up, you know, presidents and all the rest of it. Um, I think it's Westlaw is what it's called. And so what you do is you get a printed book and then every six months or something they would send you um, a printed leaflet and you would put it in pockets. So you would go to the book and then you'd have to go to the back of the pockets, you know, to update yourself because it was too expensive to reprint Westlaw, you know, every few months. And so, you know, the, the great thing about the digital age is that you can do instantaneous updating. Of course. Um, yes. And, you know, and also as a veteran of the Library of Congress where I worked in card cataloging at the year that they were moving it to digital. They were moving it out, of, but the error potential for card cataloging was very high because it's relatively easy to misfile. And then you're also totally dependent on the decisions of the cataloger as to, you know, the categories and, and the whole bit. And the stumbling block was, was the other alphabets. They, they were okay at the library transitioning the card catalog right. to English language, but at that point, there weren't easily available fonts for Cyrillic or Chinese mm -hmm. or all kinds of other things. So it, you know, it was an enormously complicated thing that went on sure. forever. 
but it seems to me that Britannica would truly benefit from, you know, the ability to use multiple fonts, multiple languages, Absolutely. and, you know, update whenever your experts. Speaking of experts, who are your experts? Yeah, well, we know uh, a lot. A lot. We have more than uh, almost uh, 120 Nobel Prize winners. Wow. Like right, for Britannica, and scores, countless of Pulitzer Prize winners uh, and, and other Hall of Fame type experts. Okay. Uh, interesting, the, the, uh, I just finished editing recently the 250th anniversary collector's edition of Britannica that you can see here tonight. And one thing I'm also doing is I, I'm going to be auctioning off two celebrity signed editions of this volume here in the United States and one in London for a UK charity and a, U, and a US charity. And in there we have many of the experts who have signed their articles and others who want to sign articles that relate to, to them, to their topic. Or so their for words. example, we have a, Walter Camp was one of our uh, writers back at the turn of the century, the creator of national, of the creator of gridiron football, American football. Walter Camp is a long dad, but I got uh, a Hall of Fame athlete you know, uh, to uh, Joe Montana to sign his article. Oh my God, you've so gone into branding. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, James Patterson is everywhere. <laughs> Seriously, that's so clever. Yes, but and I think only Britannica could probably pull off this project yeah. because for example, the other, the, the other folks signing articles run from Martin Scorsese who wrote a nice piece for us, an essay for us on uh, film preservation, yeah. and the challenges of preserving film today to the Dalai Lama, to Bob Dylan. So I don't know how many books are gonna have Bob Dylan or Dalai Lama and uh, you know, Jimmy Carter all in one, all between two covers. So Who's gonna run your auction? Um, I have a company in, uh, in, uh, in Chicago. Okay, I mean, it sounds like we could get some really big money for yeah, something like that. Yeah, we certainly hope so. And all the money will go to two literacy charities, one here and then one in the UK. So what is your business model now? I remember the old one, you know, when they would come to your door and they'd say, <laughs> ring the doorbell and all that. And I remember my parents buying a set uh, when I went into junior high school, which was, Lord, 1951 or two or something. Um, and that was, you know, our big study guide. But how are you How are you supporting it all today? Is it a still a subscription basis? It is, but, but not so much that. I mean, if you look at Britannica.com, most of the encyclopedia is available right there. There will be ads on the page, so we, yeah. so we have a revenue model based on advertising like most websites do. Like Facebook? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. But also, we market to the institutional, uh, to the institutional market, schools around the world. So I'll show you a slide in a little while. Uh, Britannica products and services are in 88 countries of the world. Uh, last year, we just finished a very large uh, educational video project for the Department of Education of Egypt, and all of the work was then translated into Arabic taking that model and marketing that to other Arabic countries on the African continent. So we do an awful lot of work overseas. We have seven um, offices around the world, Chicago, New York, Springfield, Massachusetts, because our sister company's headquarters there is a Merriam-Webster Dictionary Company. That's one of our companies. Right. London, Tel Aviv, we have a couple of companies in Israel, Tokyo and Sydney, Australia. No, so Edinburgh? Not Edinburgh. This is so sad. <laughs> we do not have an office there, but we do in London. Well, the way things are going at Brexit, you may wind up with an office in Edinburgh all over again. That's exactly right. So we're doing extremely well. Uh, we also, That's great. in addition to the encyclopedia, which is available, of course, digitally, we have all kinds of uh, teacher um, supplemental aids for the classroom yeah. around the world. And, and you again, sell those, I'm assuming. Those, absolutely. Yeah. So Theoretically, they have budgets. And all that other yes. stuff. Do you still <laughs> print the whole the whole volumes? We don't. We stopped printing uh, right. the Encyclopedia in 2012. That was the last, the last year. The last print edition. The last year. And it was time to do so for all the reasons you also yeah. said a little while ago. That in order to keep any type of database up to date, you really need to do it digitally. You just cannot do it in print. And let me give you two examples. We're okay. talking about the difficulties in card catalogs. Well, I would say not only is it updating, but searchability. Those Absolutely. are the two benefits of Absolutely. digital. Absolutely. Let me give you an example. For the longest time in the print set, the, the, the major city in China was Peking. And to, the, to our last edition in 2012, it was still under P, under mm -hmm. Peking. We could not possibly do the editorial labor and the printing labor to move the P to B for Beijing. 
it was too large of an article. To, it was not cost effective to do. So you had to have a cross reference. You had to still have Beijing wow. up to 2012 under P. Likewise, our, our beautiful article in Jazz, written by uh, Gunther Schuler, a Pulitzer Prize winning composer, was under musical theory. But we could not move it to the J's for the <laughs> longest time because it was too expensive to do that, to rip up the sets. The no. market wasn't there for the print sets anymore. It was too labor intensive sure. to do that. You don't have any of those problems in the digital age anymore. So it's very no, liberating. No, no, absolutely, absolutely true. And I was thinking about like Africa, for example, where they change names of countries like every 10 minutes or something. You'd have a really hard time. Oh, we've had the entire African <laughs> thing would be a nightmare. The re reunification of Germany yeah. was a nightmare. Oh, of you think of all point. the cross-references, the thousands sure. of cross-references in the encyclopedia to West Germany and East Germany, and what that meant for encyclopedia folks. It was a nightmare. Mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> I wonder what ever happened to my original, you know, that's the sort of thing you don't really think at the time, like baseball cards, for example. Think of all the people threw away their early baseball cards and would now like to film themselves. <laughs> you, know, you, don't, you don't really plan, you know, to keep like, how many, what's that, like 25 volume? I'm trying to remember what a whole yeah, set. In 32, but 30, let, me sh let me show okay. you here. Why don't you launch yeah, into your program when you've here. kind this of done is, all this? This is the first edition of Britannica, and this is a, a picture of the set that we have in our archives in Chicago. It was three volumes. It was intended to be useful, uh, utilitarian. A lot of the encyclopedias on, on the continent were very large and massive by the French. And the Scots were very practical. They wanted to turn a profit, and they made it extremely handy in three simple volumes. And this is our this is our copy here that came out in 1768. That's so exciting. Can I interrupt you? Sure. Yes, when did Dr. Johnson publish his dictionary in Scotland? Yeah, was it roughly early, this time? A little earlier. A little earlier. Right. So you already had that out there. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a right. leap. Okay. Absolutely. What's interesting about this set that we have in our archives, our own set is it's missing an article. It jumps 41 pages in the ends. <laughs> and it jumps because it's missing the article on midwifery. And I point this out because to talk about perseverance and what a company like Britannica has had to deal with over 250 years, that kind of staggering change from the 18th century to the digital age. But as a startup company, this is the, these are the kinds of things we had to deal with. It was missing the article not because there was anything offensive in the text. And by the way, why would it be one of the largest articles in the encyclopedia? Because the number one killer of women, of course, in the 18th century was childbirth. There was a need for practical information on how to, how to survive, how to save a woman's life during childbirth, and how to deal with such things as breach birth. And so Britannica had a very detailed article for the public on that. However, what got us in trouble was not the text. It was the illustrations. These were the our illustrations from the first edition of Britannica. They were the most graphic and detailed anatomical illustrations of childbirth ever mass distributed in the English. It was Dr. Hunter, right? I'm sorry? It was Dr. Hunter. They just had an illustrated article in the, oh I think the Wall Street Journal. There is an exhibition, I can't remember which museum, and I, I mean, I'm recognizing it, and it is these drawings by Dr. Hunter, who was a brilliant anatomist in Scotland at this time. Um, and they, I remember, because they, they have that one, um, the picture of the baby. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so the King of England, King George III, was outraged by this. Mm -hmm. He considered this blasphemous, uh, pornographic, obscene, and he instructed all loyal citizens in England to destroy the Britannica article in their life room. And the fact that our set in our archives in Chicago is missing that article leads us to believe that the original owner of our set was a loyalist mm -hmm. who did exactly what the king instructed him to do, wow. and that was to destroy the article. Oh, think of all the lives that could have been saved if, in fact, they had left this article in, because breach first. But the other thing, and sadly, that nobody realized until 1920-something, if, if the midwives had just washed their hands. And people wouldn't have gotten purple fever, which was a huge killer of women because they, they would go from one childbirth to another and take all the germs with them. Sure. It was so sad. Sure. So illustrations have played a critical role in, in, yeah. in, 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 in the way in which Britannica Those are engravings, right? Influence. Yes, they're engravings. Let me give you another example of the way in, of illustrations that have affected culture. And it's a way of measuring Britannica's impact over 250 years. 
You have two illustrations here on the left and the right. Both are from our famed 11th edition of Britannica, which was published in 1910 and 1911. You see a Coca-Cola bottle here. Back in 1915, the Coca-Cola company issued a challenge to all of its bottlers to come up with a new design for the drink that was so distinct that a consumer could feel the bottle in the dark and exactly ascertain that was a bottle of Coca-Cola. It would be that distinct. So the challenge went out, and the Root Bottle Company in Terre Haute, Indiana, sent one of their employees to the library to research the two main ingredients in Coca-Cola. And that's the copal leaf, the main ingredient in cocaine, and traces of cocaine were in Coca-Cola up to 1929, and the cola nut. But instead of pulling those illustrations from the, from the library, the employee came back with the Encyclopedia Britannica illustration on the left of the cocoa pod, the main ingredient in chocolate. <laughs> and it was this bulging ribbed cocoa pod that they fell in love with and that led and spurred the creation of the ribbed bulging Coca-Cola pod. <laughs> So accident is the mother of invention. Mm -hmm. Well, it really is, but I have to wonder what would have happened if they'd actually done the coca leaf with <laughs> some kind of a, you know, gigantic. Because um, I think a lot of people didn't realize that Coca-Cola was actually Coke. That's you right. Know, That's cocaine. Right. Uh, I mean, just like laudanum in the 19th century, you Absolutely. know, it was all opium, but people drank it because they thought it was a health, you know, thing. <laughs> or just like aspirin, which wasn't invented until, I think, 1922. Um, so, you know, we think that we're a druggy age, but we haven't got anything on the Victorians. <laughs> we don't. They right. didn't have any painkillers to speak of, you know, not prescription ones, so right. they had to make do with Coca-Cola and, you know. You're right, and in fact, we kind of get that distinction of soft drink. Yeah. From about 1929, when they stopped using cocaine, traces of, of Coke in Coca-Cola, and we get this distinction between a soft drink and hard alcohol. And soft because of the is that where it came from? I never yeah. even thought about yeah. where soft came from. On the right is also an illustration from the same edition of Britannica, the 11th edition, 1910 and 11. And that's an uh, illustration from our costume article. And the art director of the New Yorker magazine, looking for the cover art for their very first edition of the New Yorker in 1925, grabbed from Britannica the exact illustration on which they based their famous mascot and symbol of the New Yorker. And you can see it's almost verbatim the same, mm -hmm. other than the monocle and, and adding the butterfly. It's Bo Bermel, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yes. I think it is Bo Bermel, yeah. Mm -hmm. The famous Regency dandy, the one, the one who lost everything, absolutely lost everything, because he couldn't resist a bon mot, and he got mad at the Prince Regent, who was grossly overweight, and at some party he turned to someone and said, you know, who's your fat friend, referring to the Prince oh. Regent, and that was it for Bo Bermel. <laughs> Seriously. He died, he died in exile in Calais, um, you know, proving that when there were kings involved, we had to really be careful. Absolutely. Yeah, but they, no, it's a great image of the New Yorker. I had no idea that was the origin story. So this gentleman here, rather sober looking guy, or sad looking guy, is William Smelly, our first editor, the first editor of the Cyclopedia Britannica. And I mentioned him just to give you an idea of some of the things a startup company like Britannica had to deal with in, in the 18th century. William Smelly edited the first edition and then he abruptly quit, leaving the company high and dry without an editor on the verge of its second edition. The first edition had sold about 3,000 copies and it was enough, enough seed money to keep the venture going. He abruptly quit, quit for a reason that might seem shocking and, and, and rather ridiculous today. The owners of Britannica realized the 1770s that people were beginning to increasingly get their information from a new type of literary form. And that new literary format was the biography. So the owners of Botanica realized that, just like today, we need to be aware of how people are getting their information through voice-activated systems and mobile phones. In the 18th century, they had to listen to the marketplace as well, and Botanica did that extremely well. So they instituted biographies of William Smelly, the hardliner, thought Encyclopedias should never lower themselves to dealing with the ephemera of somebody's daily life, whether it's a king or a Kardashian. It didn't belong in the encyclopedia, and he abruptly quit. But Britannica realized that biographies were catching on. That was the way of the future. You needed to start dealing with the world past and present, present through, 
to a person. So it incorporated biographies into the articles. Right? Exactly, the yeah. second edition. Got it. So they were without an editor, and they had to get another editor. And they got this gentleman, James Teitler. James Teitler was an also a very interesting guy. Uh, he had three passions other than Britannica. Number one, he presciently understood that mankind was destined to fly. And so he was a daredevil balloonist. Mm -hmm. He's gone down in history as the first Briton to fly and nearly killed himself many times in, in his experiments. Uh, secondly, he was a political rabble rouser. And he wrote screeds and why Parliament needed to have more uh, power at the expense of King George, which ticked off King George, who quickly turned his attention from our offensive plates on midwifery to now <laughs> denouncing our editor, and he issued an arrest warrant on Britannica's editor. And so our editor left Scotland for Salem, Massachusetts, <laughs> leaving us high and dry once again. His third passion uh, was women. And he was quite the flanderer. I don't know if he looks like much of a dashing gentleman, but uh, he was quite a philanderer. And I think it's, it's pretty safely a, uh, assumed that uh, any women he took up in his balloon, that probably some canoodling <laughs> Rock to the cradle of the balloon. Very good, very good. Very and good. so, yes, the answer on all of your minds, uh, yeah, you, you might have Encyclopedia Britannica to thank for the Mile High Club. <laughs> so when was this? Was the Montgolfier brothers, I thought, were the first balloonists? On the, on the continent. On the and continent. In, in Britain, they were French um, in um, right. this would be the 1770s. Paris. Okay. All right. So some of the challenges that Britannica has had to deal with. Our headquarters today, you mentioned, were in Chicago. Yeah. And this is a very common panoramic, uh, panoramic shot. You'll see a news news stories, films, TV shows. And our building, our headquarters, is right here in the Reed Murdoch building, a seven-story building. And if you know Chicago, uh, this is the Merchandise Park on the far and tower the is the, the Trump Tower on the Chicago River. Mm -hmm. So we've been here since 2005. Where's Wabash in all this? Is that um, I'm trying yeah, to think on the curve? Right, exactly. This is Wacker, That's Wacker. right here. And this is uh, LaSalle Street. Oh, well, then Wabash should be that way. But there are a couple of uh, red letter dates in our company's history that I think are, are interesting just to quickly point out for you. For example, a year after our building was, was built in 1914, it was the site of the second worst maritime disaster in American history, and that's the sinking of the Isla um, uh, steam liner. And you can see here, it happened right outside, right outside our building on July 24th. That day, the steam liner was going to take out 2,500 people, mainly employees from the Western Electric Company and their, their families, out, of, out onto Lake Michigan, over to Michigan City, uh, Michigan City, Indiana, for a nice picnic and, and a day out. But as the 2,500 people boarded from Wackford, from the, from the far side here, they tended to go to the top deck and then go to the far railing overlooking the river. And as more and more people boarded, more and more the ship began to list until finally capsizing. 844 people were trapped and drowned under underneath the, uh, uh, the steam liner. When the bodies were pulled out, they were lined up uh, for identification purposes and put in where we use our archives today as a temporary morgue. The bodies were what we use for archives for the temporary morgue for identifying the bodies, which is why today, for people who believe in such things, uh, our building is known as one of the most haunted buildings in all of Chicago <laughs> because of this incident serving as a morgue at that time. It was a real tragedy. Western Electric was the manufacturing arm for AT and T, so it was a real, a real trauma for the communication industry um, mm -hmm. to lose that many people from Western Electric. Sure. Mm -hmm. What an interesting though. The next day, the newspapers reported the, the names of those killed, and on the list of those reportedly dead was a young 20-year-old employee from Western Electric who actually was running late that day and arrived at the boat right after the campsite. So he actually did not die. His life was saved. But the re uh, newspapers reported him as dead nonetheless. And his name was George Hallis, the founder of Chicago Bears and one of the pioneers of the National Football League. Timing is everything. Timing is everything. One other important date in our, in our uh, building's history, occurred around 1926, 
1920, Chicago, the city is, is, is blossoming in population. There's increasingly number of cars on LaSalle Street. And LaSalle Street needed to be widened into a four-lane four four lane road. So the building either had to be destroyed or adapted. And so what they did was, in order to expand LaSalle Street, they took out an entire bay, vertical bay of windows. And if you look to the left of the clock tower, there are only five. And if you look to the right, there are actually six vertical bays. They did it beautifully because then they reassembled and matched the end cap here. So unless you're looking closely, you don't notice the entire symmetry of the building is off. But for me, I think it's a wonderful symbol and metaphor for perseverance and how you survive. And it's a wonderful headquarters for Chicago because it had a choice. It could either die, close the doors, or it could adapt and move on. In this case, it adapted and lived on in the 21st century, much like the Catechism. So I think symbolically, it's, it's a perfect building for us. Well, what, what street was it? That they had LaSalle the Street. LaSalle. Yeah. LaSalle Street. The loop is behind it. Yes, yeah, I'm from Chicago, so too. I know. I'm from right. 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 Mm -hmm. And my father, yeah. actually, office when I was a child was on LaSalle. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I, as I mentioned earlier, we have seven um, offices around the world. And, 88 countries are using Britannica products today, just to give you an idea how well we've adapted to the digital age. And that's just what this is showing here. These are some of the companies and entities we're working with and providing services for and content for around the world. Again, Merriam-Webster is one of our sister uh, companies. So is Britannica Knowledge Systems in Israel, which provides the, uh, the training platforms for the training of staff and crew in the airlines industry. So we do a lot of different things uh, around the world. I mentioned the YouTube partnership, which we're very excited about. And here's an example of what that partnership looks like today. So if you do do a search on the moon landing, you will now see at the very top a box highlighting the Britannica article. And if you highlight one of the videos, you access one of the videos, you will see the link about the Britannica article underneath. Again, how we're trying to be part of the solution to the problem of rampant misinformation on the internet today. So we're very excited about that. One writer who is kindly and who has uh, sagely discovered how well we're doing in the digital age is Dan Brown. Uh, and in his latest thriller, Origin, Dan Brown being the author of The Da Vinci Codes, um, he has this wonderful quote, the fax machine has gone the way of the dodo bird and the iPhone will survive only if it keeps outperforming its competition. Typewriters and steam engines died in changing environments, but the Encyclopedia Britannica evolved. Its cumbersome 32 volume set, sprouting digital feet, and like the lungfish, which can survive on both land and in water, expanding into uncharted territory where it now thrives. So thank you for Dan Brown. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Dan Brown, for noticing. And of course, that tenacity and that resilience in the face of great change adversity and uncertainty is exactly the same kind of secret to success that I found in the 10 individuals I highlight in the other book I worked on at the same time over the last year and a half on True Grit. And I think the 10 figures I highlight in, in this second book are folks you, you probably recognize. The top left here, we have Madeleine Albright. Madeleine, Madeleine Albright actually worked for Britannica in 1960 before she got into government and politics when she was a dutiful housewife, mother, following her husband, who was a journalist for the Chicago Sun-Times, then around the country. She worked in our advertising department for a year. And she tells a wonderful story in her autobiography about how when she came for the Britannica interview, of course, this is 1960, the heyday of the Mad Men type environment. She was, of course, interviewed by a male executive. And he point blank asked her a question, of course, that no HR department could ever get away with today. Uh, when do you plan on getting pregnant? <laughs> to which Madeline Albright uh, replied, not at this moment, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we have Clara Barton next to her, the founder of the American Red Cross, Theodore Geisel, Dr. Seuss, and uh, interesting story, uh, again, if you don't know some of the later years for, for him when his wife committed suicide and what he had to do to persevere through that. It's a very interesting story that doesn't get told very often. Walt Disney, 
Marie Curie, two-time winner of the Nobel Prize, also Britannica contributor. She wrote a number of articles for Britannica. Um, she suffered a very embarrassing sex scandal in the early 20th century that does not often get discussed and, and talked about in our history books. Uh, but I go into that in that chapter on uh, Marie Curie, again, as a sign of what women in the sciences, particularly the hard sciences, had to deal with to make it in a field dominated by, by men, particularly 100 years ago. It's a very interesting story. We have Edison, Ian Fleming, you know, the greater than um, James Bond, one of the most enduring characters in all of film and fiction. Ruth Handler, Ruth Handler, the creator of the, the Barbie doll. Her life story is fascinating, particularly how she completely remade her life in the second half of her, of her life, uh, changed um, careers out of necessity when she was removed from the board of Mattel. It's a very interesting story of what she did after getting breast cancer and what she did for other breast cancer survivors and to build a career around that is, is fascinating. Again, you might know her by the creation of Barbie, but what she did the whole second half of her life often doesn't get discussed. Very interesting tale. Abraham Lincoln, and of course Joe Lewis, the great heavyweight boxing champion, the foremost African-American uh, leader in the 1930s and 40s. So again, if you're ever in a position of having to compose two books at, at one time, which is a very taxing thing to do, uh, there is a great benefit if there can be a thematic connection between the books. And in my case, I was very fortunate with the, with the deadlines I had for Britannica for the anniversary volume and my own publisher's deadlines for my own book, if there is a connection. And again, having that same secret to success in both Britannica and the 10 individuals here, and that same common element being that passion and perseverance in the face of adversity and change, being grit that helped make composing two books at once uh, much more easy. Delighted to hear that. Tell us about the 25th anniversary edition. You say this is the last one. Yeah, this, the 250th anniversary uh, edition is our last yearbook. We've been printing yearbooks for, for 80 years or so, and this is our last yearbook, uh, which was always a print volume, but not a lot of market for print encyclopedias or even the yearbook. You might remember the yearbooks very often matched the print set, right? So they would go together on the shelf and look beautiful on the shelf. But if you no longer have the, the print set, the days of the, the yearbook are kind of numbered in that form too. So our last yearbook was this special 250th anniversary. And again, it's, it's a wonderful book, I, I think, if you take a look at it. And it's very much divided into past, present, and future, highlighting a lot of the eclectic, Older entries from our old entries going back to the 18th century, like a bloodletting. Bloodletting, of course, was the answer for any ailment. Anything that ever ailed you, you simply open a vein and bleed for a while, and you'll be better, according to the 18th century. Except for hemophilia, but apparently they didn't know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> and George Washington, who pretty much was bled to death. Uh, and I talk about that in there as well. So there's very interesting stories uh, in, in there in the first section about the evolution of knowledge and how our, our you know, how we, we've gained uh, knowledge through the centuries. There's also articles on in the 18th century from Britannica where to find unicorns. <laughs> we very much thought unicorns existed <laughs> Do you know what in South is? Africa. Do you know what today is? I do not. It's National Unicorn Day. Is that right? Absolutely. <laughs> today is the day. Yeah. Patrick knows that. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's right. It really is. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so there, there you go. I thought you planned it. I did not plan it. I did not. Uh, the second half of the book highlights many of our famous contributors and the, and the many Nobel Prize winners who have written for us. And then the third section of 33 special essays I commissioned uh, from Martin Scorsese and Film Preservation, Madeline Albright. James Baker, uh, even Monica Lewinsky did a piece for me on cyberbullying. She was very much an advocate on, on fighting cyberbullying. She did a very nice piece for us on, on that topic as well. So the, the book really shows where we've been, where we are today, and then essays from noted scholars around the world on where we're going tomorrow, particularly in the era of artificial intelligence, robotic warfare, and what that could mean ethically as, as well as socially for us. <laughs> So what was your path to become the editor of Britannica? History. I studied history. Where? I studied at Boy College and I did my master's and doctor work at, um, at Harvard okay. in history. Yeah, and then from there I came on to Britannica. 
got my master's in history at Northwestern, so I wasn't sure okay. whether, you know, you did a bit, they had a wonderful history department. Yes, absolutely. Right. So you probably do some work with Northwestern since it's on your doorstep. We have. We have. We've got a partnership with them, particularly with videos. Yeah. Excellent. How long have you been? Uh, 20 years. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a wonderful place to work, and it, it's a very exciting time for us right now because folks ask, well, what are you doing in the digital age? But it's really our value proposition being a fact checked, verified database and sources like it's only growing in importance. It's not diminishing. So people are, how are you adapting? Really, the rest of the world is coming to us <laughs> because the bloom is off, right? The flower of the internet. Just getting information is no longer, we no longer get no. over simply getting yeah. information. We now are more concerned about how do you get the right information, quality information, how do you differentiate that? Google has not figured it out yet. Algorithms can give you related information. It cannot necessarily bring you to the relevant information or the credible information yet. They have not yet figured out how to do that. And that's part of what we hope to take. Well, it's the credible part that's so hard. You know, this right. whole fluff about the vaccination problem, you all read about the measles epidemic and, you know, the fact that the, the incorrect information about vaccines that was perpetrated by a British medical journal, uh, article that somehow managed to get in it even though it was bullshit um you know has caused all this um anti-vaccine movement and then on facebook a lot of that information was still available so you have all these kids that traveled like i think the big problem in new york was some kid went to israel that hadn't been vaccinated and got measles and then he brought it back and because the hasidic community is so small you know now they have like this terrible measles epidemic going on it all stems from an inability to really screened information, that whole, you know, false information about vaccinations should never have gotten out there, but it did. And, you know, the problem with Google is there is no way to tell which is um, a accurate or authoritative or whatever it is. You know, you just get a whole bunch of stuff that comes up. And if you're not trained to figure out what is a legitimate source and what is just whatever, you know, there you are. So, I'm a convert. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch out of Wikipedia to Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> like a I mean, I like to think that I probably can figure out the right stuff, you know, and right. Wikipedia and all the rest of it. But why make it hard? We also did one other thing last year. We we created what's called a, an online extension for your yeah. browser. A browser extension. It's called Britannica Insights. It's free to download. You can download it in seconds. And what that will do is anything you search for on Google. It will immediately, on the right rail, bring up Britannica's articles at the top of the page. Yeah. If we have coverage on it, we'll make it very easy. It will come right to the top right rail. So just look up Britannica Insights. And it's very, it takes just seconds to download. We're not going to have everything. If you do want to know what the Kardashians uh, did last week, uh, we probably won't have that information. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well. Right, you can't be that universal. But right. then I don't actually care what they were doing this <laughs> week, so it's not going to make any difference. You know, no, this has really been incredibly <clears throat> insightful. I feel so stupid that I hadn't even thought about some of this. If, if any of you really, that you, uh, has anyone here really thought about, you know, whether it would, oh, was it your shoe? <laughs> <laughs> I thought the microphone sometimes do that. Um, whether Britannica would be a useful source for you? Oh, and you're going to go away thinking that it was a good idea to come tonight and figure that out, right? Good. Yeah. I'm very appreciative. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank um, you, Barbara. For well, no, it's really been a pleasure. What questions would you like to ask him? I have a question. Um, when you're talking about writing the 250th anniversary edition, mm -hmm. and you talked about part three had all the essays in it, did you solicit those people to write those essays, particularly for that? Yes. Yep, absolutely. Specifically have, for this volume. Do yes. you have like a, are you like a manager that has a team of people working for you? Yeah, we have an editorial staff. We have about 250 or so folks in Chicago and about another 250 or 300 worldwide wow. working for us. Um, we have a full fact checking staff, editorial staff, copy editing staff, indexing staff. Um, so again, these things are missing from a lot. Probably, Barbara, you could attest to this, even in book publishing. We're talking to have massive editorial staffs for copy editing, proofreading, 
I did actually. <laughs> <laughs> all in one person. Yeah, all the I did. All. I did the time. No, I mean it. It really is, and and you know, it it came up today. I had to write um, a letter for a book that we're going to publish that basically goes out to reviewers in the advanced reading copy that says, you know, this is why we bought the book, or you know, and we're publishing it and so forth. And I sent it off, and by accident, my husband, my best critic got a copy of it because of some weird email thing, although I hadn't included him, and he wrote me back, and he said, you know, this should go, this is too long, and by the way, you didn't really explain why she's like Jack Reacher, and I thought, you know, that's why everybody needs an editor. I mean, absolutely everybody needs an editor, because you don't, when you're writing it, you can't really tell how clear you are, or, you know, this was not a fact-checking issue, this was just a, you know, did I say what I actually thought I said issue. But then it gets worse if, um, you know, fact checking is wrong or it's all too easy, you know, the things you think you know. You know, it trips me up all the time, just McDonald's and Starbucks, which of them has the apostrophe? <laughs> I'm really serious, that comes up constantly, you know. I mean, Patrick, what do you run into? Patrick's done a lot of editing. What are things that you've run into? Um. Kind of, yeah, mainly just uh, just inconsistencies and Clari clarity. 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 Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the main thing. Yeah, I think I see a lot of typos. Right. I see a lot of grammatical spell mistakes. Spellcheck has done the work. You know, nobody knows how to spell discrete anymore <laughs> when they mean when they mean you know sub rosa or whatever it is. Everything is the mathematical discrete. I just read something today, and there it was again, discreetly, D-I-S-C-R-E-T-E-L-Y, which as far as I know is not an actual word. I like I like Gentile poverty. I come across Yeah, that Gentile poverty, right? <laughs> <laughs> there, I mean, but, but, but I know that most of that is spell check. Um, and then, you know, nobody can conjugate sink, sink, sunk anymore. I mean, he's, he's sunk into a chair. It's like, you know, drink, drink, drunk is easier, but sink, sink, sunk, something or other is too hard. Um, and, you know, copy editing is, is, is a very difficult uh, mark. There's a new book out by the New Yorker, since you brought it up. Their longtime copy editor, Queen, and she's called the Comma Queen, so presumably she <laughs> understands commas. Um, but she's written a book called It's Greek to Me, in which she talks about some of her essays in you know, doing copy editing. Um, and then there was a surprising hit in March or, Larry, do you remember in March or February by the chief copywriter at Random, copy editor at Random House? What's it called? We've had it here. It's actually a bestseller. Yeah, it's on, we have it. I just can't remember the title. But anyway, so, you know, another person <coughs> who's published a, an actual bestseller about what it's like to copy at a, at, a, at a major publishing house. But you've got even more pressure at Britannica because I mean, you kind of get away with it in a novel. You know, people aren't gonna really ding you if the screen is wrong, but in Britannica, if you've got a fact wrong, that's a major problem. Yeah, it is a problem. We're not perfect. Well, course. nobody yeah, is perfect. Nobody is perfect. But a lot of folks expect us to be at Britannica. And so, yeah. you know, we take it very hard when they do find an error. And I can tell you, having written a lot of big portions of the 735, I do know of an error in there. I'm not going to tell you where it is. <laughs> oh, is it a treasure hunt? So, <laughs> 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 yeah. But you know, it, keep, it still it. keeps me up at night. And then nine months later, I know exactly what line has that wrong word. This and you know what? It was a spell check. Was it? It changed the word. So it's correctly spelled, but it's the wrong word. I've it's turned off autocorrect on my phone. It exactly drives me absolutely <laughs> insane. You know? I mean, it is, I mean, it really can, can yeah. do you in. Yeah. yeah. Did in one line, so but I'm you, not going to tell you where. You clearly love doing this. Oh, absolutely. You really do. Isn't it fun absolutely. to find somebody that is so happy and what is this work? You know, it's just very you, Are you, uh, can people go in and, and tour your building? and? Um, they, they can't, but we have <clears throat> folks stop in and we're happy to show them around. Okay. If they want but, to. Yeah, we'd be happy to, to have folks in. We don't have a, a official tours necessarily, but if somebody but really if wants somebody to just come wants up, to of see course, the building, absolutely. you're more than welcome. You're this is welcome. the book I was talking about. It called Dryer's English, mm -hmm. and this it, it, Larry found it over there in New York Times bestseller list. But this really is by the um, copy, as I said, he was the chief copy editor at Random House for a really long time, um, forever. 
Happy Chief. Um, so it's worth reading if you're at all interested in this kind of thing. So can I bring my source books team from Naperville? <laughs> yes. We'll have a special party, right? There I'm bringing the copy editors <laughs> with me. It'd be great to have a copy editor party. It would. Cool. Yeah, we'll do that. Because I have to go back to a sales conference and all. That'd be really fun. Okay, nice great. to see you there. Right. Anybody else have a question? Where? I have another question. Oh, sure. Um, how did your team or whoever at Britannica decide what you were going to have in the anniversary edition? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, we talked about it as a team. Uh, the, the design, the three-part design is something I came up with thinking about the past, the present, and the future because we wanted, I wanted, to reinforce some folks that we're not backwards looking. And that it's wonderful to have these eclectic articles to show about the evolution of knowledge of making unicorns existed in South Africa, et cetera, et cetera. But it's important for us to look forward that we're a living entity. Britannica is doing some very exciting things today. And at the drop of a hat, we can get folks like Martin Scorsese to talk about film preservation, and Madeleine Albright to talk about the future of democracy, and James Baker expresses concerns about international cooperation in the world today. The Britannica has that kind of pull still, and that pedigree, and that power to get the foremost experts in the world to talk about the subjects that most concern them, and as well as to get futurists to think about what are cities going to be like in the future. What is artificial intelligence going to mean to the workforce in 40 years from now? How do we adjust? What kind of skill sets do we need to be teaching our children to deal with such a rapidly changing world, such a disruptive world, technologically speaking? Is it, is it really knowledge they need, knowledge sets, or do they need to learn better how to learn and adapt and evolve? So these are the kind of issues we're talking about in that special third section it's to reinforce the fact that uh, we're looking forward and very much looking forward to the next 250 years. One of the really terrible things about the ability to just look up stuff easily is that people don't learn how to do reference work as kids oh, anymore. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that was a major part, probably Patrick, even for you, because you're not that old, so you probably went through it. <laughs> um, yeah. But seriously, <clears throat> didn't you, you know, have we to had learn the, We had the how to card learn. catalog. Yeah, you had to use reference kids. tools, and they, you know, trained you on how to look things up and how to value the source and all the rest of it. But, you know, in an age when any kid can pick up a phone and just, I mean, you know, Google stuff. You, don't, you lose that skill set, you, or you're never trained in it at all. And most of the kids have not been trained in they it. They have They look at what are the first three results on page one of Google. They well, never even right. go below the fold. But that's one reason, one reason fake news thrives. We, we, I won't mention the author, but Rob and I last summer were visiting with an author whose grandchildren were there, and Rob asked the young man who was like 15 or 16 how he got his news, because he'd expressed some political view or something, and he said, well, whatever, it just comes up on my phone. <laughs> so Rob and I both went, you know, but, but that is, I think, a reality for an awful lot of people, and so if you weren't trained in any kind of rigorous you know, research or, uh, you know, then you would be credulous, which I think explains much of what's going on in the world today. Right. Mm -hmm. One thing I, I mentioned earlier, the example of, um, of, of the introduction of biographies into our second edition in the 1770s, again, that is, was very perceptive of our owners to realize people were getting their information from a new, a new source, a new literary type. And as I mentioned, it's very similar to what we're doing today. In order to survive as a company, a digital company, you need to be aware and you need to meet people where they live and act and socialize. It's not enough simply to produce the encyclopedia and leave it on a shelf somewhere. You have to bring it to where people want it and where they'll use it. So two of the partnerships we have is with Amazon Alexa and with Samsung. And before long, you're going to find Britannica content in the voice-activated products and appliances in your kitchens around the house, whether it's your microwave or your oven or wherever else, you're going to be able to have voice activated information. And again, we want Britannica content to be there because it's verified and reliable rather than simply gathering it from unknown, so unknown sources um, online, which some voice activated systems are doing now. Do you know what I find really terrifying is here there are all these warnings about how, you know, um, the state would take over your life and control all of us through. 
do you realize that we're all volunteering for it by buying Alexa <laughs> and your smart appliances and even the toys that children have and the whole bit? I mean, I'm absolutely your car. It's madness. You know, but I mean, what's really interesting is this totally voluntary. The state is not enslaving us. We are <laughs> holding up our hands and walking right into it. I, find, I mean, I am never going to have Alexa. Sorry, or anything similar to it. You know, I can't control my refrigerator or my, or whatever, but by God, I am not going to have one of these either. But I understand why people do it. Um, and you're right, you do have to. I have another question because you have a competitor called the Oxford English Dictionary. How are they doing? Are they moving into the digital age? Yeah, have I, they? I, yeah, I think they're doing very well. I don't think anybody is good in the dictionary. Uh, market as well. They're not doing as well as Merriam-Webster is doing in social media. Okay. Uh, my colleagues at, in, in Springfield in New York who, who operate and run Merriam-Webster just do a magnificent job with their word of the year and in tracking trends and vocabulary. They're routinely getting picked up by major newspapers and, and, and yeah. stories written about them, about how they're tracing the evolution and impact of certain words. So Merriam-Webster is doing extremely well in the digital age. We're very happy to have them as a, as a sister company. company. We used to live and die by the OED. When I was in library school, we used to tell dirty jokes in the stacks all based on stuff in the OED. I'll let you go home and look up the word Merkin, M-E-R-K-I-N, and see if you can figure out what the joke was. Right, but, um, but they had the same problem that you do, or you know, in the sense it was a massive printed volume. God, how big was it? I mean, it was, took up like whole shelves at libraries and stuff. And then what did they do when it was time to update it and say so you were back to Westlaw in the pockets, you know, because you couldn't reprint it, so they would have to update it on a fairly, well, I don't know, annually, whatever, and so as librarians, you'd have to go and, you know, file the updates into the OED, and then you're back the same. Really, the digital age, sure. in that sense, certainly makes, you know, it's fabulous for reference yeah. books. Let me mention one other quick quick way in which Britannica has tried to bring information to the masses in a novel way. Back in the 1930s, during the Depression, it was very difficult for folks to have the kind of money necessary to buy encyclopedias. Right. And we were finding during the 1930s that people were very concerned. There were, there was a, a great deal of anxiety about where the next paycheck was going to come from, where they were going to be living. And they had a lot of questions about the changing world around them, the rise of fascism in Europe, unemployment, etc. So they had a lot of questions. But they couldn't necessarily afford Britannica. If they did, they had the kind of questions on a practical basis they needed answers. And as you said, without the digital age, you can't simply at the drop of a hat throw something in a new print set and print out all 32 volumes to get that one answer in. Right. So in the 1930s, we created something called the Library Research Service. It was entirely operated by women. And it, it, by 1950, it expanded to 100 women researchers. And we were re requiring back then a master's degree for women to work in our department. It was one of the most intellectually sustaining, uh, uh, intellectually rewarding jobs for college-educated women in the 30s and the 40s was to work at Britannica. And what people could do, if you bought a print set, you got 50 gummed coupons in the front of the volume. And on a postcard, you could take one of those gummed coupons, put it on a postcard, and ask Britannica any question you wanted about anything from sex to the stock market, <laughs> you could ask us. And a woman researcher in our library would type up up to a 10,000 word personalized report answering your question. And you got to do 50 of those, submit 50 of those over a 10 year period. And then we called it quits. That was all you could do. You could ask 50 questions over 10 years and we're not doing another one for you. That was amazingly popular. In wow. fact, the desk set, if you all like old films, Spencer Tracy and um, Catherine, uh, Catherine, uh, Catherine Hepburn, right? The dust set was based on the Britannica woman What's that? director oh, really? of the library service. And again, in there, she's operating a department of women researchers. And Spencer Tracy comes in to revolutionize things with an early computer. But it's modeled on the library research service at Britannica. And again, these women were given a great deal of information, a, a great deal of liberty in their job that they just could not find elsewhere. For example, a Britannica researcher would travel from city to city with a Britannica typewriter, deposit it in the train station locker for the next Britannica woman researcher to go 
pick up and then use that in the next library in Kansas City or, or in Sacramento. And so we had these Britannica lockers all over and these women researchers traveling by themselves from city to city researching these reports for folks. And this gave people, this was amazingly, it was an amazing marketing tool for Britannica to keep the brand alive during the Great Depression, but it also gave people hope and it gave them reassurance that someone out there cared enough about their single question to do a personalized report. It was a magnificent job of marketing and it really helped sustain the brand during a very difficult time in the country. But again, it's those kinds of things that companies need to do if they're gonna survive 250 years. Uh, and Britannica has done that. One last question many people ask, is Britannica the oldest operated, still continuously operated company in the world? And we're not. There are many companies in the world that are actually older than us, 250 years. And they tend to be hotels, inns, pubs, and bars. <laughs> so apparently, the oldest enterprises in human existence are places where you can get drunk and places where you can sleep it off. <laughs> so not quite sure with that, what we were supposed to take from that. Uh, My husband and I are going back to our favorite hotel in Ireland, and the motto of the hotel is excellence since 1228. Wow. Ashford Castle, look it up. It really is. So proving your point, you know, and it's still excellent. And they have reinvented themselves time and time again too. It's really interesting to watch an institution like that go. I don't think the bookstore will make it that long. What do you think, Pete? Well, for we, now. we won't be here anyway. <laughs> so it's an interesting thought. You know, we're we're forced to try to evolve the way we work on a relatively, you know, I mean, almost every day. So, you know, um, you don't have to grow or die, but you do have to adapt or die. I mm -hmm. think that's a very a distinction very that lots of businesses don't make. Just growing doesn't really help you. You have to adapt on, on the way. So, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much for Thank coming. Isn't it been great? Yeah. 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 Thank you. have the anniversary yearbook. Did you bring some of your book with you? I did. Oh, good. Absolutely. Okay, because we were a little concerned about that. So if you'd like to get a copy of either one, we can do that right up in the front. So thank I thank yeah, you so much for coming. It was a wonderful talk.